Yeah. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, this is our first talk uh, with Paul Climate. Uh, thank you for joining us. And our first talk today is uh, with uh, Joseph O'Connor from Climate Trace. Climate Trace is a coalition that aims to provide accurate and near real time estimates of carbon emissions for uh, all the major sources globally. It's a pretty incredible technology and it's a really important part of solving climate because you can only reduce what you can measure. Uh, and in many cases, uh, companies might not provide the information themselves. So sometimes you have to sort of measure it remotely. And uh, today we'll hear specifically about the way that Climate Trace estimates emissions from uh, coal power plants. Um, Joe is a senior data scientist at Transition Zero, which is an organization that is part of the Climate Trace Coalition. He's been working at the intersection of machine learning and energy for several years. And now uh, he's leading the organization's work on power plant monitoring. With that, uh, on to Joe. Thank you. Great. Um, thank, thank you for that. I can skip skip my first introduction slide now. That's that's great. Um, yeah. So so I'm Joe, uh, senior data scientist at, at Transition Zero. Um, oh, there we go. And so I, I'm not really a huge fan of, of content slides, so we'll we'll skip over this. Um, We'll just very quickly unpick um, the relationship between transition zero and and climate trace because um, it can be slightly slightly confusing. So cl climate trace um, is is a coalition of of organisations, non profit organisations, of which transition zero is is one. Um, of companies using remote sensing technologies and, and machine learning to, to monitor worldwide worldwide greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and we have a number of um, of members all specializing in, in different different subsectors. Uh, here at Transition Transition Zero, we work uh, on on the power plant side, as said. Uh, also in, in heavy industry, which we won't won't touch upon in this in this talk particularly. Um, and oh, also worth mentioning is that that the, the electricity generation part part of the project. So so the work that I'm talking about now um, is done in, in partnership with with another nonprofit uh, called called What Time. You can see at the at the bottom there. So Transition Zero um, is a UK nonprofit. A relatively new new entity um, spinning off from from another nonprofit called Carbon Tracker Initiative in in December of last year. We're a team team of economists and data scientists um, building data applications and financial models with the aim of informing business and policy decisions in the energy sector. Um, so right now that that mostly involves writing reports. Um, and last month we, we published our, our first one, which is called Turning the, the Super Tanker, um, containing economic analysis of, of several hundred um, Chinese coal plants. And we'll, we'll sort of touch on that report a little bit later on. So this is a, a slide stolen from, from my boss, Matt. Um, at the top, we've got got a map view of uh, every coal-fired power plant in the world. Um, on the bottom left, we've got a time-lapse of uh, satellite imagery, I think I think Sentinel-2 imagery of, of a coal-fired plant in China. And in the middle, we have a, a wiggly blue line of, of some kind. I'm, I'm not sure if that's, that's doing any, anything, anything useful. Um, that's great. So the project that I work on, the Climate Trace um, Power Plant Project, is focusing almost exclusively on this, this bottom left box and in turning uh, these images into um, a series of predictions of the, the activity of a plant um, and integrated estimates of the utilization and the emissions of, of that plant um, and of hopefully all fossil fuel power plants um, over time. So the way, the way this, this fits in with um, Transition Zero's other work is that, um, is that the utilization of, 
of power plants and of coal plants um, is is a very important factor in in our economic models and for a very large number of of plants um, particularly coal plants in in China we have we have zero data on the um, on their on their operation. So, um, onto the, the the project itself. Firstly, um, expanding a little bit on on why we're doing this. So, this is um, another map view of of all the coal plants in the world, where blue dots are um, plants for which we have um, publicly available generation data at the plant level and red dots are plants where where we don't um, and they 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 outnumber the, the the blue dots quite significantly um, so why do we care about monitoring coal plants at all um, so I've touched on this this already obviously coal plants fossil fuel plants uh, in general release release a large amount of co2 and to a large extent, data on the on the operation of these plants uh, is either incomplete, um, unavailable, or difficult to access. And even even in these blue dots, um, we found that actually getting hold of and using using that data is not not always um, trivial. Um, and as I said before, if if we're making economic arguments. Um, for a shift away from coal, then then more data about how coal plants are being being operated um, helps us to to make make a more convincing argument. So, uh, how does it work? So, uh, increasingly, we're all able to access. Um, images of, of any part of, of the world um, at any point in time. Give or take a few days. Um, and obviously advances in, in machine learning and computing power mean that we can we can also um, do all sorts of core analysis on this amount this amount of, of data. So in our case we want to build machine learning model that can can look at a picture of a power plant um, and there are some examples there and and have a guess at what is going on at that plant so is it on is it off roughly how much power is it generating or how much what is its percentage utilization and roughly speaking if, if we can if we can kind of have a go at this by by eye then then with enough with enough data then we should um, have a shot at, at, at training a model to do it. Um, and so we build we build models to detect three three main types of, of signals at, at these plants. Number one, um, and the most the most universal one is the emission of, of vapor from, from flu stacks. Um, or chimneys. So um, every or, or very nearly every power plant has has a flue stack, um, which is doing the same same job as the flue pipe in your in your home boiler, just carrying the exhaust from from combust combustion um, from from the generator to somewhere else. Um, and it's full of it's full of water vapor, which which gives rise to um, to the big clouds you can see here in the in the top right. Signal number two is very similar, um, and so for for around forty percent of global coal capacity, um, we see a type of cooling called natural draft cooling. So that is. Um, what you can see here on the left are these very large cooling cooling towers, um, and we really like 
we really like these towers and these plants um, because this this gives us by far by far the clearest and most most easily um, detectable um, signal. Um, so finally, um, particularly, well, in, in plants without cooling towers, um, another common type of cooling is is, is uh, once once through, which is where heat from the plant is being dumped directly into a, a nearby water source. Um, and in the, the image here, I, I believe that, that that's a lake to the to the bottom right. And so, with some luck, and um, not not many examples look look as clear as this one, we can use um, thermal infrared bands on on satellites to detect the the increase in temperature from these this hot this hot water outflow. Okay, so so what next? Um, we have three ways of, of observing generation, and now we want to train some models um, to do it for us. All right, so so firstly, this this requires data, um, and in our case, firstly we need um, we need satellite images. Um, and for training, we need to we need need to be able to link those images to to known generation data. Um, and and a lot of work, probably the the majority of work on the project goes goes into um, into into this this process. So um, we kind of have three three main categories of of data. Firstly, what we call power plant inventory data. So this is just um, simple plant data, things like name, its name, its location, its size, ownership data, etc. Um, and there are there are a few different um, there are a few different sources of of this kind of data um, that we that we kind of merge together. Um, the things that the things that are important for us. So, in order to to obtain satellite images for a plant, we firstly need to know where it is. Um, so we need coordinate coordinate information. Um, then, in order to know which type of signal to look for, we require its its cooling type. Um, and in order to, to figure out roughly how much power it is likely to be generating, um, we we need its capacity. There are a few a few other um, important bits of, of data that, that that we collect, but but these these are the three the three most important. And so, especially well, for for for, for training data where where we're going back. Um, going back a few years in time in, in imagery and in generation data, there's an added layer of complexity here in that <coughs> the, the cooling type and the capacity need to be need to be understood um, as a time series. Um, and we need to understand whether the plant has been retrofitted with different type of cooling or um, whether new units have been built or units have been, been demolished. Um, <clears throat> and so, so the collection and, and maintenance of this specific power plant inventory data set um, is probably the single the single part of the project that that takes the most time and has taken the most time. And this this owes to to a couple of things. One is very large amounts of manual detective work. Um, particularly in in geolocations um, and non-trivial um, linkages between between these different plant level data sets. Um, 
So not not only are data sets often unlikely to have some shared ID, but they may not they may not even understand um, they, they may not even share the same concept of a plant. So you may see many many to one relationships and that kind of thing pop, popping out of these um, these linkages. Um, and so just a, a final note on this is that that I'm relatively confident in saying that our cooling type and plant geolocation data sets are likely to be the, the most complete um, in the world. We significantly improve on <clears throat> on it, on any of those uh, those underlying data sets. So I think I think we locate uh, we we would take coordinates for, for something like 95% of global coal and gas capacity. Um, so next, ge generation data. Um, so this is exclusively for, for training. Um, this is just where we're gonna take, take, our, take our image, um, take our plant, and find out what the generation was for that timestamp, say whether the plant was on or off, say, what its utilization rate was um, and so we scrape we scrape hourly generation data for for plants um, from publicly available data um, in those countries where it, where it is available the blue the blue dots from earlier and right now that's that's the us europe and and australia um, there's a couple of other places where where data is available but um, we've not been able to to use it just yet um, and this step again requires painstaking and non-trivial linkage with plant level um, data. And so finally, we, we continuously collect satellite images um, for these plants from, from three different um, instruments or, or constellations. The first two, Sen Sentinel-2 and, and Landsat-8 are, are multispectral satellites with public, publicly available data, um, which we collect using the, the Google Earth Engine platform. Um, Landsat 8 comes with, with a lower resolution, but, but it's the only one with this, this thermal infrared band that, that we were looking at for, um, for detecting signal in those, those once through plants. And so between, between these two um, free data sources, we, um, we see an image around once or twice a week of, of every plant. Um, so we're hoping we're hoping to add a commercial data provider to, to this mix, um, the Planet Scope constellation from Planet Labs, um, which will push that that revisit rate to um, to once a day, um, which makes a big difference when it comes to to stitching together these these predictions at the end. Okay, so um, onto the, the models. So the first thing we tried to do on the on the modeling side was um, was to just point point some kind of model at a crop of a power plant and predict whether it is off or on. Um, and obviously, with, with a small extension to this, we can we can do the same thing with a with a regression output, um, which for which we use um, a utilization prediction. So the, the generation divided by the capacity of the plant, um, which tends, tends to be easier to predict than, than the, raw, the raw generation. Um, and so we train these models in a cross-validated way. Uh, we use grouping over, over um, plant IDs in order to, to test generalization, generalization between between plants and to unseen plants. Um, and the first simplest type of model we use is just uh, an XG boost. So a feature-based model. And in essence, what we try to do with this model is just, um, just detect white blobs in our in our images. So at, at its simplest, we can say, if this image down in the bottom left 
has a big white blob in it, uh, then the power plant is probably on. And if it doesn't, then it is it is probably off. So we just do, do some very simple feature engineering, um, statistics over a small region um, centered on the plant, the mean, min, max of, of all of our satellite bands. Um, and these models work fairly well, um, at least at, at the simple off off on classification problem. Um, balanced accuracies of, of around 80, 80 to ninety percent, um, at least for for these these um, these simplest plants, these natural draft cooled plants with the large cooling towers. Um, but they fail in in kind of the ways that you'd expect. So clouds in the image um, mess things up, and um, small plumes from from the towers are often undetected. And so we have image data. So of course we're also using convolutional neural networks, um, and the convolutional neural networks looking at um, these these large crops over the um, over the plant are just um, doing fine tuning using pre-trained architectures. Um, we find that 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 is necessary to to achieve any kind of performance, and specifically we. We, we fine tune on networks pre-trained on remote sensing and aerial imagery data sets. Uh, so Big EarthNet and Resisk 45. Um, and these CNNs, they work slightly better than, than the, the feature-based models. Um, so they, they, they still get hurt by clouds and by small plumes, but, but they do do ever so slightly better. Um, <clears throat> but one thing they do worse at, uh, and bo both of these models do, do quite badly at, is um, overfitting to, to the background in, in the image. So we can see, um, we can see in this, this image in the bottom left here that the actual plant is not taking up that, that much of, of the image. Um, we have to, we have to use a relatively large crop because of um, impreciseness in our in our geo in our in our geolocations. There's also a separate issue here that there's a, another power plant to the to the right, but we won't won't talk about that. Um, and so when we were building these kinds of models, we would often see strange um, artifacts in our out of sample predictions. Stuff like every single power plant that was in an arid region <coughs> would be predicted with very high confidence to be on, even if it was off and there was no, no, not even any remote signal of uh, sign of it being on. Um, and so we do account for, for the possibility of plant level overfitting with, with our plant, plant wise cross validation so we can detect it. Um, but detecting it is not the same as, as solving it. Um, so we tried lots of things here, but, but the most the most successful um, was changing to to a new a new kind of multi instance architecture, and explicitly um, focusing our models on just the parts of the plant that we expect to to show signal, and explicitly excluding um, the irrelevant bits. So. We can identify by eye the parts of the plant that, that produce signals, these, these little cooling towers and, and chimneys. And we believe that, that forcing the model to focus on, on these and ignore the background is likely to, to improve performance. Um, and so the way, the way that we, we achieve that, that focus, excuse me, is to, to cut, out, cut out these little fixed size boxes on top, uh, centered on each of the the objects of interest um, in the image. So we're now going from, from considering um, this whole image on the left um, as a single instance linked to a single label to considering uh, these 
five image patches as a set of instances mapped to a single a single label. Um, and this 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 is multi instance learning. So so we're predicting a single label from from a collection of objects. And so in a non deep learning setting, and and this is exactly what we do with with our our XGBoost models here. What you would what you would do here is uh, generate a feature vector for for each of these five little patches. Um, so, for example, the feature vectors that I was talking about the the min, mean, and and max of all the bands <coughs> for each of the patches, and then apply some some kind of aggregation. So, so for example, you'd have you'd have like a final a final aggregated fe feature vector that contains features like the max of the mean activation of the green pixels in, in each patch. And our multi-instance CNNs are gonna gonna work in a in a similar way. Um, but they're gonna use use kind of a, a cool trick um, at the at the aggregation stage. Um, so we now have an arbitrary number of patches per per, per image, and we're going to apply this the same CNN block to each patch independently. Um, so for for Keras users, this uses this this is a using a, a time distributed layer, and these these output um, a. 1D feature vector per patch. Um, and so we have we now have a an n patches times number of um, elements in the feature vector um, matrix that we want to again flatten, aggregate down to, to a single a single feature vector. Um, and so because taking taking the the mean or the min or the max, as we described um, in the last slide, um, seems like throw, throwing away a lot of information, especially in the in the case of large numbers of, of patches. Um, we we instead use a kind of uh, attention mechanism, and this is this is inspired by the. The paper that, that I'm referencing in the top right here. Um, so basically, we apply a second shared CNN block to to each image patch, which generates a um, a single value, um, and those values go through a softmax. So they sum they sum to one, and that means you then take a you take then take a weighted sum of the feature vectors, um, and you get you get an attention weighted output. <clears throat> and so, this allows the model to learn which patches to to pay attention to, which patches are, are important in generating the the plant level prediction. Um, And so these types of models, both both the the, the patch CNNs and the, the feature-based ones, produce significant accuracy improvements um, over over the full full image models I was describing at the beginning, um, and almost entirely remove background overfitting by by definition. Um, we reduce the number of issues relating to clouds um, and signal leakage from from neighboring plants which we could see might might be an issue in the in the images earlier um, and in the case of our CNNs we also we also decrease training time by, by a lot because we're now replacing large 400 by 400 images with a with a number of much smaller 32 by 32 patches um, the one drawback is that we now not not only need to precisely locate every single fossil fuel power plant in the world, but also every single 
object of interest inside each of those plants. Um, and we do that we do that using OpenStreetMap. Um, so for anyone who hasn't hasn't used it, OSM is it's kind of like Wikipedia for for maps. Um, users contribute tags and geometries, and this includes defining power plant bounds and tagging cooling tower and flue stack locations. And so we have a team of two two people whose whose job it is just to go through every power plant we know about, produce these kinds of annotations, um, validate the ones that that already exist. Um, this is obviously extremely time consuming, but it comes it comes with a bunch of, of benefits um, listed here. So pr primarily, um, it means that a human being looks looks at every single plant that we're modeling and can flag if there's anything strange going on there. Um, we also um, we also get some 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 more cooling type information for free. So we get to fill in gaps in our cooling type data set um, by, by um, inferring it from the types of annotations present at the plant. OK, so we've built these image level models now, and um, we're going to going to use them for something. Um, so what I'm going to talk about here is the, is the report that I referenced right right at the beginning, um, turning the the super tanker. So this is, was released um, around a month ago, um, and as I said before, is an, an economic analysis of a large number of coal plants in in China. And this is the first real sort of fledgling, real world application of of the models described earlier. Um, so we selected a relatively small number of plants, 116 um, of the largest natural draft cooled coal plants in, in China um, that we believed we could we could accurately model. Um, and then we used our, our image level predictions to, to attempt to generate monthly plant level utilization predictions. So this is one of those um, those plants from the from the last slide, and this is these are this is a series of images from from that plant in early 2020. Um, you can see sometimes it looks on, sometimes it looks off. We run our image level models over over each of these images and build up a time series of, of what we call image image level predictions. In this case, these are these are regression predictions. Um, and so next, we require a mechanism to to turn these image predictions, um, these these image level prediction time series, into integrated estimates of the generation of the plant or the utilization of the plant. Um, and for this particular report, we did this with with a simple um, ensemble model. So for for each type of image model. We generate a feature vector of time-wise rolling statistics at multiple window sizes. So, for example, you know this is the this is the average prediction of uh, the XG Boost multi-instance model over the last ninety days, and so on. And these are then fed to a regression model um, that predicts the utilization of the plant over the last thirty days. And we pick we pick approximately monthly utilization, um, so we can compare it with with uh, other data sources later. Um, so that there are some opportunities for some pretty nasty types of, of overfitting happening, uh, overfitting to happen in this this kind of uh, ensemble, um, which we attempt to to keep on top of by by using aggregate validation data. So. Um, as said earlier, China, China doesn't publish plant level generation data, but it does publish monthly region and country level data. And so if we aggregate our plant level predictions to, to the region level or to the country level, 
we can compare it compare it with government statistics and if we see rough rough agreement in the scale and the shape of um of those utilization time series then then we have some confidence that that we're doing something okay um and so this is this is a plot an animation of a plot for um henan province from 2016 to 2021 and the, the thin blue lines being overlaid on each other show our kind of raw 30-day um, rolling utilization predictions for, for each underlying plant. And the blue line gives a, a capacity weighted um, average of those lines. And finally, the red line is, is provided by the, the China Electricity Council. Um, so this is one of the one of the regions that that gives best agreement, which is why I'm showing it. But um, we also see fairly good agreement in in um, the majority of of regions. One one interesting thing about this plot is that you see you see a relative lack of uh, coronavirus dip in in China compared to um, most of the rest of the world. Um, so I've touched a little bit on some, some of the specific technical challenges um, in the project uh, earlier in the talk. Um, but I'm going to gonna sort of explore them a, a little further now. Um, so firstly, time, time of day bias. Um, all of our satellites are in some synchronous orbits. And that means that they all, they nearly all observe power plants uh, in the mid morning local time. Um, so no matter how many images we get of a plant, we can only really ever say what it is doing at 10.30 in the morning. Um, this is difficult to get, to get around. Um, where possible, we, we use country level um, time of day curves, demand uh, generation curves um, to, to apply a correction. Um, another fairly fairly serious issue is the issue of bias in our in our training set. So as mentioned a couple of times, we, we only have training data for, for the US, the EU and and Australia. Um, and so this means we have nothing in the whole of Asia, the whole of Africa, the whole of South, South America. Um, and this can lead to, to, to tricky to spot types of, of, of over, overfitting. And the, the, the example I give here is, is, you know, the simple case that um, the US, the EU and Australia operate at higher capacity factors than, than the rest of the world would be impossible to, to, to detect in, in cross-validation um, and would, would mess up your results pretty badly. Uh, classic problem for any remote sensing based um, project, clouds. It's especially problematic for us because clouds look like plumes um, you can see a, a pretty nasty example example here. So this left plant is is clearly on. The one on the right is is actually also on, but also has lots of these these sort of wispy um, clouds over the top of it. That's that's going to confuse uh, confuse basically every every model we have. Um, and so because because cloud cloud masks can't tell the difference between plumes and and clouds, we kind of have to have to let them be a little bit. So we allow a, a certain amount of clouds into our data set, and just hope hope that our models can um, can understand what's going on. Um, another serious issue is the effect of temperature on on plume formation. Um, so. The 
plumes coming from from flu stacks are very very rarely visible in satellite imagery um, at anything above 20 degrees celsius um, natural draft plants so those those plants again with with large cooling towers tend tend to pro produce some kind of plume across nearly all temperatures so so we're relatively fine here for for that sort of 40 percent of of coal plants but in any other plant we're relying at least partially on on plumes from from those chimneys and it means that we already struggle to make in any predictions um in entire in entire countries for for some parts of the year and this problem gets worse for gas plants um solely because there are fewer um, natural draft gas plants um and then yeah a plethora of data quality problems um that i won't touch upon too too much um this is a little bonus slide uh so transition zero's other climate trace project is in is in heavy industry so uh, we again use satellite data to um, to detect the activity of um, of steel and cement uh, and petrochemical plants primarily through the use of um, infrared information detecting hotspots. Um, I kind of just threw this slide in there because I think it looks cool. Um, so that's the end. Um, and I'm gonna gonna open for questions. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Um, yeah, pretty pretty fascinating work, and uh, I think yeah, highly non obvious. Like it, it's definitely like not obvious that you can just go and measure emissions of heavy industry or power plants from satellites. Like you would think this is something where like if they don't give you the data, you just have to live with it, but apparently not. Uh, so, yeah, some of the questions we have here, the most upvoted one currently is uh, what kind of action is being taken based on the estimates that Climate Trace makes? Um, so, right now, uh, we haven't published any data. Um, our, first, our first release of data is planned for uh, later, later this year. Um, and that will be available through the, through the Climate Trace website. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we don't have we don't have any real specific plans. Our, our hope is that um, this data will be used by by whomever wants it, but governments, um, nonprofits, etc. Mm -hmm. The the one specific concrete use case that we have is is our own our own use of the data. So tra transition zero's use of the data mm -hmm. um, in informing informing economic analysis. Mm -hmm. So. The point, the point of that analysis is to, um, is to shine a light on how un uneconomical, well, partly to shine a light on how un uneconomical coal plants are, specifically in this case in in China. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had some, we had some fairly positive reports. It's difficult to know um, of the reception of of that report report in China. Mm -hmm. Our hope is obviously that China will stop building new coal as it as it must. Yeah, hopefully. Got it. Uh, yeah, thank you. So, um, yeah, like availability of this data is really important. Like from what I heard from talking to a bunch of other climate companies, uh, like all over the sectors, everybody is saying we need data. Like we need specifically data on emissions of private companies. Uh, like there are a bunch of companies that are trying to collect this data set. So I guess when you guys publish it, it's going to enable a lot of businesses to do a lot better, not just governments and uh, nonprofits, but also commercial businesses. Yeah. Yeah. Another question. Um, OK, there is another question that asks whether you use operational data when available to validate your predictions. It sounds like the answer is yes, uh, because you use operational data for training, if I understand the question correctly. Uh, and you showed some slides comparing with uh, government reporting, right? Um what kinds of operational data? Um, well, the person who oh. asked the question does not clarify that, but I suppose this means basically, like, do you validate your predictions against what is being um, uh, reported uh, in cases where it is being reported? 
So yeah, yeah. So so mm -hmm. yes, um, and and we showed that in um, I showed that in the in the in the China slides. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're not. Um, yeah, that that that's one of one of our main one of our only ways of really validating our outputs in those countries mm -hmm. where um, where we don't have have plant level mm -hmm. data. Yeah, that makes sense. And we probably have time for one more question. So uh, another about the question, I believe you already answered by showing the example of heavy industry. Uh, but uh, here's another one. Uh, have you guys considered hosting a Kaggle competition? So it seems like you probably could also publish the data sets and training data, right? Like I actually have looked at Kaggle to see if there are any climate related competitions. There is nothing. So you guys would be the first. Yeah, um, I, I absolutely love Kaggle. I learned, learned my trade through Kaggle. Uh, and we have we have spoken about it. Um, mm. There's some there's some challenges. So some some of the data we use is commercial, particularly our, our power power plant databases and and re republishing and and opening up that data mm -hmm. um, may be difficult. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, I personally, and I think I think a few people are would definitely be interested in in going down that route. Yeah, yeah, that would be really cool. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, thank you so much, Joe, for this uh, excellent talk. Um, we're at the end of the time slot for this session, uh, so I'm going to end the broadcast. And yeah, see you, everybody, at the next talks today. Uh, one about uh, smart grids with Resync and another one about battery manufacturing with QuantumScape. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everyone. Bye.